I hope, um, you know, this, uh, even if you're not interested in fighting robots, I hope that inspires <laughs> folks out there listening to, to start thinking about things that you can build on Bitcoin um, that actually leverage its sort of um, its innovations as a global, you know, uh, computational network. Hello and welcome back to the show. Today we have Jerry Chan joining us again. Jerry, hope you're doing all right. How you doing? Doing really good. Thanks, Brittany. How, I'm really uh, happy and honored to uh, be back on your show. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show, Jerry. Always a pleasure. But as I understand it, you you wanted to get into a discussion mm -hmm. about Frobots. So what is Frobots? And kind of give us the the little intro, the, the spiel, so if you will. Spiel. I'll give you the, the five minutes, um, and, and then we because once I dive into it, I could literally go on for hours. Um, but uh, the five minute spiel is, is Frobots is kind of the platform that I've been sort of secretly working on. Um, and it's basically competitive coding uh, or e an esports uh, for coding or for programming. So uh, that, that's that, if that's too geeky, then maybe the more digestible form would be like you write robots, algorithmic robots, which fight each other to death for fun and profit. <laughs> so kind of like uh, the, the Internet's version of the, the robot fighting. Robot Do you remember wars. those? Yes. Oh, my yes. gosh. <laughs> that was a that was a big inspiration, actually. Yeah, the the, the digital virtual form of that. Um, actually, in every way. I mean, in, in the mechanics, in the fact that it's a competitive sport, ex except for the fact that, you know, battling, uh, sorry, uh, battle bots or whatever it was called, that that's physical robots. But you have it's a, it's a feat and test of co of engineering, right? It's an engineering competition plus a little bit of like reflexes because, you know, they have the remote control and everything. So robots is kind of like that except minus the part with the remote control because the game of battle bots is like you build a, a physical robot and then you 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 literally control it and fight it so half of it is building the robot and its abilities and the other half is controlling it where robots is like 100 percent building it so there's no there's no control aspect it's almost like you build an algorithm that's going to do you know what you think is going to uh, be a winning strategy to win and then you, you throw them all in a box or in an arena and watch them fight it out until somebody wins. And you can actually see them like in an arena fighting it out or, or is it just like a bunch of code that you see like interacting with each other? What, what's no, it'll, the... it'll be an actual arena. So it will be an actual arena. Um, right now, the, the front end is being worked on. So right now, um, you, while it's playable, you'll just see sort of like blocks, you know, <laughs> that are moving around and then sort of like shooting at each other. So it's not really three dimensional or anything. It's, it's like Tron 1982 or nice. 84. <laughs> 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 you know, the game grid is just like two dimensional uh, uh, from, from, uh, seen from an arcade it, it's kind of at that level right now but uh the intent is to make it a little bit more um exciting for the eyes so that it's a little bit more of a fun spectator sport um but this idea kind of uh came to me because i was exploring the the generic computational capabilities of bitcoin and what i mean was like um bitcoin could be a global computer this is the dream that vitalik has been spouting since 2015 <laughs> except not really ex not really executing in a way which is uh, practical, right? right? Because I think the the global computational power of uh, Ethereum is, uh, I've heard, is about the same as a calculator, right? It was <laughs> say, same as this. Oh, there you go. So if, if Ethereum can't compute more than this, then I would rather have, you know, 10 millions of these out in the public or in other people's hands, which is distributed, or having one giant version of this owned by <laughs> called Ethereum. <laughs> Um, it doesn't really make sense if you think about it. But um, so I, I was exploring how you can do parallel computation on Bitcoin because of all the things uh, in, in Bitcoin SV, which has enabled this possibility with its opcodes being uh, restored, which makes it Turing complete. Um, so you can build, you can you can sort of build finite state machines. Um, Craig has said uh, sometimes oh, I don't remember exactly, but he's mentioned in his talks right in the past now in public that Bitcoin is effectively like a, a, a giant um, um, predicate computer, right, where where smart contracts are kind of like tra state transitions on a state machine. And then this way you can kind of you, you can it, it can be um, equivalent to a Turing machine. 
and that's already been shown by folks like Xiaohui with S Script with you know some some academics who've proven it on paper people have written Conway's Game of Life on BSV so <laughs> it's not even dispute anymore so okay but what is the cool what is the commercial application of this I was thinking right it's right. it's I started thinking well maybe you can build computation generally and then just just charge for computation right I mean that'd be interesting but um but i got halfway down that uh, rabbit hole you know i got three months researching it built a little small prototype and then i realized wait i don't really think this is the world is ready for this because the question i asked myself was um what as i put on my business hat you know, i took off the hacker hat <laughs> and i, I, I uh, and i said okay now i've built this prototype is this better than aws is this better than google cloud is anybody going to pay for this and the answer is no, why would anyone pay for this? <laughs> I'm thinking, I mean, you don't have the guarantees you get from Google Cloud or Amazon or Microsoft Azure. Uh, you, you get you get none of that reliability. You get none of the tooling um, that makes it easy for people, the developers to set up applications and software, as a, you know, SaaS apps and stuff like this. So you really get nothing. But I mean, I saw, I see the potential and I do see that maybe eventually all of these tools and everything can be built, but it still kind of requires a bootstrap, mm. right? It, it's kind of like, okay, so if I wrote this server that you can run, and by running this server, you are now opening the doors for computation. Like anybody sending um, compiled transactions, um, you could pick up, you could execute, you could spit back the transaction, collect a small microtransaction in Bitcoin. Okay. Is that gonna be worth your while? I mean, are you gonna make enough money to, to make running this server worthwhile? Probably not. I mean, they, like, I mean, microtransactions, right? So you execute a piece of code. You think to yourself, how much is somebody willing to pay to execute Hello World or, or I don't know, a chat app, right? right? I mean, a chat app is free. WhatsApp is free. Telegram is free. Signal is free. So you're competing with free. So you're asking the clients, the payer side to say, I want to pay one cent for every, or maybe even a tenth of a cent for every right. message versus free. Um, and then you're asking the server to spend the server side person running the host to spend maybe $50 a month running a server. And he's going to get what a dollar, $2. I didn't, so it's really requires a bootstrapping because it's a problem that the market's not demanding right now. I it, it, sorry. It's a solution that the market is not demanding right now. And that's how I came to Frobots. So I said, okay, let's take this idea of a, of code, which can be executed in a virtual machine, right? right? That virtual machine, um, is effectively run on top of Bitcoin because it's not miners that that uh, that will do a lot of this computation. It's it's stuff that runs on top of Bitcoin and using the Bitcoin transaction and blockchain as kind of like the uh, the the system bus, right? As a way of passing messages back and forth between parts of the CPU, the global CPU, the right. network CPU. And and so from that idea, I thought, well, what's one thing that people will pay for? Okay, games. <laughs> Right, esports yeah. e games. Uh, I think esports is on the way up. Uh, I, I did some research uh, for a while. Uh, you know, successful game platforms like Roblox, 150 million active users. Um, kids go and, and crazy they, for it. Kids are great. My kids are are, are play it. Um, <laughs> Minecraft's another one. A sandbox oh, yeah. game. So uh, and uh, but but interesting of those uh, like Roblox because it has its own economy. Like it has its own creator economy, user created content. People build the games in Roblox and then yep. other people play the games and they they transact in, you know, in their internal currency. And then you can cash out to US dollars. So people can actually make, in my opinion, a positive economic impact. Like you're actually creating value. You're you're not you're not spinning wheels, you're right. Um, you're not mining Warcraft gold, although some people might argue that's a positive economic impact. I, I suppose I did I it for a long know. time myself, so <laughs> I can't I can't talk about it, you know. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> I can't say much. But yeah, I used to mine gold. So. Uh, then the, yeah, okay. So clearly, it was positive for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, 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 it is a, it is a very interestingly debatable point. Uh, but but I think in general, the 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 opinion is it it does provide some value that value is entertainment value for the person willing to pay um Absolutely. and so you know you can't put a price on entertainment right I, if somebody wants to watch uh you know sports on tv 
is that wasting electricity? Uh, is you know, is it wasting money to build a stadium? I guess clearly not, because sports have that societal effect, which you could argue is positive most of the time, unless it's FIFA. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like in WoW, they introduced this like coin that basically was like equivalent to one month subscription. One month mm-hmm. subscription is like fourteen ninety nine. So you know, you mine enough coins, you buy some, you know subscription coin off somebody i mean technically that's money you're saving in the real world or you could buy one sell it on the auction house i mean uh, all of those things introduce a, a, an interesting dynamic into the ecosystem and it's very similar to like what's going on in bitcoin but like so i'm, I'm curious to you know so everything's being run off bitcoin it's sitting on top uh, what, what kind of like protocol or, or or like what's the the main mechanism that you're using to to bring all of this to fruition uh i i the so, so robots are are nfts themselves i mean but i don't like to really advertise that as an nft game because right now the word nft game has some connotations which i really want to distance mm. ourselves from it's not a game I mean, NFT, I mean, okay, think of an NFT game, Axis Infinity, I don't know, like, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, Hello Kitty, no, Hello Kitty, <laughs> Crypto the Kitty. Crypto Kitties, yeah. Yeah, most of those games, if not all, okay, let's say all, I, I mean, I can't speak for really all, but all that I've looked at, all of the game NFT games I've looked at are effectively games where the NFTs are just collectibles. Mm. Right. I mean, they they are in game items per se, but they're but they're just collectibles. Like their value is purely collection collection value. Like even in Axis Infinity, you use their internal co- token to spawn and generate more more of these little Pokemon characters, and <laughs> their value is only in collection because their uniqueness. Right. So everything is just repeating that same that same trope in BTC, where it's like it's scarce, so it's going to be worth money. It's like uh, not everything scarce is worth a lot of money. I mean, I have a whole, you know, closet full of Bazooka Joe bubblegum wrappers. I mean, I'm sure they're pretty rare. I mean, but an old, I mean, they're like 50 years old. Are you going to pay a million dollars? Garbage patch. uh, (laughs) The the trading cards for the garbage patch kids. You remember those? Those, yeah, I yeah, I have a couple of those, and yeah, they would a couple of rare ones in good condition would be worth a lot of money, but, <laughs> but how you know how many of them are are really make everybody rich? It'll make right. it'll make a couple of collectors rich. Um, so so it's not an NFT, in that sense, but it's an NFT in the sense of uh, this every every robot is a digital agent, right? So it has its value is in its history. Mm-hmm. Um, like it's it's historical sort of timeline, like when it was born, all the fights it's been in, all its record. Um, so even so if you cloned a robot at a given time, like its code, it wouldn't be the same because it wouldn't have the same history. So so you could argue that that makes one more valuable than the other. For instance, if if you were to take Muhammad Ali and you cloned him, um, and he, then the clone would have all of let's say all of the memories, all of the physical attributes of, like of Muhammad Ali. Is there a difference between the original Muhammad Ali, who the actually lived, version. right, of the clone? I mean, everybody is gonna will will, will agree that there is a big difference. One is the real one, and one is fake. <laughs> and why is because you can always tell the fake. The fake look has no scars. The fake has beautifully baby fresh skin. Um, maybe he thinks he's the original Muhammad Ali, but he can't he can't show that he is. He even knows he's not, but because like I remember getting a, you know a scar here, but I don't seem to have it. I guess I'm the clone, right? So th- there's th- that value. It, so so even though both fighters at that point in time would probably perform pretty similar in a fight, one of them is worth more because one's the original. Mm. So 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 that's the same premise I having I'm I'm exploring with robots is that NFTs are valuable because of its history, right? And and like it, it, how it's changed hands. Who's owned it in the past? Maybe you're famous because somebody famous owned you in the past, and that's on your record. So that makes you more valuable. Um, and the other aspect that that makes uh, these NFTs um, have value is the fact that they have a revenue stream. I mean, in 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 insofar as you know, you're you playing the adult version of robots, and you're able to gamble a bit or or do some betting, right? Friendly betting among friends, kind of thing. So you have you can sort of map out the future revenue stream that this this robot will make so you can clearly do future value to present value and say well it's worth this much look it's won these matches in the past it's earned this much 
uh, tokens in the past or, or you know, uh, you know whatever the game currencies in the past. But right. each each bot is like programmed by the coders. So like anybody with coding knowledge can come in, create their own and yes. then say, like you're saying, uh, say, OK, it, it's going to make this much money over this much time, assuming that it, it, it performs as well as it has during these fights. And then they could sell it to another coder and then that coder could take that bot and then exactly. code in some new things and, and kind of make it their own type of deal. Yes, exactly. exactly. Interesting. Um, and, I, and I just realized I didn't answer your question. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, to go r around the question of like you said, how is it built on Bitcoin? Um, so so these uh, these robots are NFT tokens, so they're on a token protocol. And right now, um, we're looking at uh, the Stas protocol. Um, cool. Be because yeah, it's just because of the uh, the ability to to put a lot of the logic um, into the Bitcoin layer itself, the Bitcoin script itself. Um, because I, I because you know it allows us to do some low level logic like um, the that when you trade a robot maybe there's royalty that needs to be paid to the previous owner you know somebody maybe contributes updates the robot but doesn't own it right you want to be able to allow the person who updates it right the 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 mechanic to collect some sort of royalty you know future revenue streams all that's really easier to lead, easier done in Bitcoin script. Mm. Um, than trying to write the smart lo uh, contract logic outside of Bitcoin script and then having to run a smart logic, you know, sorry, a smart contract processor or server ourselves. Um, it also allows this this whole idea to eventually grow just beyond, you know. Yeah, and, immediately yeah. I was thinking about like, man, you know, in the future you got you got these robots that could be like passed and traded around or sold or whatever and upgraded by different programmers and whatnot. Eventually it might get to a, it might even get to a point where one programmer is like, Hey, I wrote a code that what, you know, uh, if you buy this code from me or this NFT code, uh, it'll execute a function and you can just like take this and add it to your, to your bot. And they just program, you know, that's that specific function and then yes. sell it. Exactly. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, maybe I need to, uh, we, we should talk later about bringing you into our marketing department. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly it. I mean, every, every component you can turn into a little piece of, of code. And once, once you have, once you already have this idea established that your robot is a piece of code, like it's a simple, you know, function uh, finite state machine, it's a function. That's all it is. Then, and, and that is an NFT. So it's not much of a stretch to imagine that that function, that robot needs other little helper functions, little bits of code. And those are, could also be pieces of code which can be written and, and traded and charged for um, and have its own value, right? So, so it, be, it really, I ho I'm hoping this bridges people's understanding of like, this is what a world, this is what really Web3 is about. I mean, mm. I, assuming web, when people say Web3, because it means so many things these days. Assuming when people say that they mean like a tokenized internet, right? And and, and I believe that in Web three of a tokenized internet means really having pieces of valuable, useful things wrapped up in a token. Right now we have valuable, but not so useful. I mean, maybe <laughs> you appreciate having a rare ape, but. That's not useful, right? I mean, right, right. ninety nine percent of the time, it's not useful. It needs utility. It exactly. needs utility. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's like when when people will buy this piece of code because they want to use it as part of their robot, like upgrade and stuff like that. Well, then it's then these pieces of co these tokens become a real commodity now, right? It's not just a commodity like Bitcoin with without any meaning, right? Bitcoin is just money commodity, I suppose. But robots have a it has a, like a real usage commodity. It's 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 a piece of thing, a code, a function which can be used in this game platform. So it becomes like I don't know, like a, like metal, like nickel, right, or, or palladium. It's it's not used as metal. I'm mean, not sorry, not used as money. These things are used because people build things with nickel and tin and uh, and copper, right? So so I I think I think that's kind of like where I want to push this you know this idea like nfts aren't just for collectibles yeah i get that 
So my next question would be like, so I can understand like the the whole like esport aspect of it, where you're pitting bots against each other. But you know the users behind it, that's kind of a whole other aspect, you know. So I'm curious, like, what type of implementations you've added or thought about to include like the user perspective. So like, if there's a dev that comes out and he's like, man, this dev, whatever bot he touches is just undefeatable. It's the greatest programming dev, you know, like. Is he gonna get some type of like NFT card that's like, man, if you buy code or or some specific yeah. function from this person, you're you're pretty much guaranteed to win, you know, or something like that. Like bringing in the aspect from the the player aspect. I think yeah. I think I spoke to uh, to Haste Arcades about that, and they were adding in uh, similar functions to their Haste Arcade games, where um, you can buy NFT cards of the the gamers that are playing the games and whatnot. So I'm curious if if this game might have similar functions to kind of include not just the robots themselves, but the player aspect of it as well. It, it certainly is something I'm looking at in the future because um, I believe that the players aren't invisible. They can't be. They can't be sort of invisible go hands of God into this economy, <laughs> right? You know, there's things that move. Things happen and nobody knows why. It's because the players are doing it. <laughs> kind of like Tron, right? The, the yeah. user is always out in the clouds, and us programs are just down here in the game grid. <laughs> um, it, it's not going to be more like that. I, I do. I do want. Um, I do foresee th this whole economy to include, like, well, in this case, players. Okay, I, I, let, let, let's classify players because you can have owners mm. who, who will play. Um, then right. you have builders. Right, and and I guess we can call them developers, but I'm gonna think of a, some nicer name for that. Um, you know, like like the people who are very good at, at improving robots. The users. Right? They, they, okay, we can call them users <laughs> as not to Tron then, right? The the users who are just like hacking away at the thing. So you got users, you got owners, you got you got um you got um crafters, right? Got people who are just making objects, um, which which, which uh, or or you have arena builders. I guess what you would call them is like architects. Yeah. Right? Oh they yeah. Just build, like, the, Didn't even the actual, think about that. Yeah, the actual match. I mean, it doesn't always have to be the same um, terrain that people play in, and maybe you like that particular map. Um, so, so you can have people building that. It really is the Roblox model where everybody builds everything. Like people build everything, right? And and eventually, for robots is just a platform, right? Where where we just control this economy, right? Um, as opposed to dictating it. Um, so so. I, I, I do, I, I'm trying to mimic that uh, economy building where you get to reward good um, uh, users. You're incentivizing right? the users to actually create. And I, and I totally right. get that. My next question to you would be, I mean, uh, BSV in general is kind of uh, lacking developers and, and, and programmers. So I'm yeah. curious, like what type of, um, uh, creator functions you're creating to help facilitate easily making things for somebody like me to get on right. and be able to create a, a landscape or, or a bot myself. I'm, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, and, and I swear to God for the audience, we did not coordinate this before we started recording. <laughs> um, like, but, but seriously, you are just reading my, like you're, you're, you're plugged into my brain here. Um, <laughs> Uh, cause I was like, how am I going to bring this up? Uh, no, uh, that, that's exactly a very good point. And, and the first, the, one of the initial things I, I wanted to make sure when I set out, um, designing for robots was that it has to be accessible to the greater gaming audience, right? It's going to be a coding game. It's going to be like competitive coding, yada, yada, yada. But I don't want that to, you know, scare away the, the regular gaming audience. In fact, I want the opposite. I want this game to teach in a way the regular gaming audience a little bit of coding so how does how do we achieve that right how do we achieve that i was thinking well i mean either i teach everybody to code uh which is like well i mean the, you, you go to school for a reason there are courses for this and i'm not going to become like a sado learn or something like that there's different places where you can learn how to code but we need to be able to get people to write code without actually writing code and so um, there are actually a lot of um, good examples of this already out there in open source space um, I just looked at what my kids are doing right they have like Lego spike has a way of you you build code by just like connecting blocks right um, MIT has scratch and scratch has a huge community of like 
eight year old, ten year olds writing programs, which are literally just throwing like colorful blocks together. So that that's the intent. I mean, I want uh, the the eventual interface for robots. Well, you can choose which interface you want because some people might actually want to write the you know, code, but you can also choose the block sort of assembler method of building a robot, and so that will allow like two people like that will allow experienced coders to play against 10 year old kids who actually don't know how to program yet but by doing that i mean we also we we have another aspect of the game whereas this could be used as an educational tool right just as just as lego is doing it in quite well actually i keep people... thinking about tom from uh what not facebook but myspace you know like back in the day nobody knew how to code but Tom was like, oh, yeah, you could put music on your on your your MySpace site just by copy and pasting this HTML and dropping it over here. You know, he came in, taught everybody a little bit of HTML and then just dipped. And so I'm, I'm thinking of something similar. There might be a website later on where it's all like, hey, this you could take this code and this code and pop it in together yeah, and just drop it together. It's, it clicks. It, it looks like assembling Lego, like virtual yeah. Lego. Um, and yeah, that that's that, I hope that's going to uh, basically open up the audience to everybody who wants to 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 code i mean we'll we'll make it you know a little bit more cool and robot themed and won't look like you know <laughs> colorful uh, lego blocks like like what scratch looks like but but that's the intent yeah definitely man that sounds so cool i'm like thinking about all the different aspects of this because um there's there's a lot of wheels and, and moving parts so how long exactly have you been working to develop this out uh so i guess the uh, probably i started in earnest was september last year um, oh wow yeah I, I think i started um like sort of architecting it in september and i probably started coding in october and for the most part it's been me until february of this year and that's when i brought on uh two other two other folks to start helping out one on the front end one on the uh I mean, front end as in the graphical front end, mm. and the other as in the uh, the website sort of a, a front end. Um, but yeah, so it's only it's still less than a year old, robots. And that this is, um, you know, I I'm I'm sort of coming out. I'm uh, you know as in I I'm okay with like basically kind of revealing what I'm working on. I at this point because we're we're at a point we're at a stage where mm. you know the the working prototype is done. And now we just need to polish it up into, you know, and, and then roll out a beta and then eventually, hopefully sometime early next year, like a release. And I, I kind of like, I'm sort of convinced enough on this. Like if you asked me six months ago, I'd be like, well, I'm still kind of like playing around with it. Like, uh, I'm not sure. Right. Like back in January, it's like it kind of, I, I think it could work. But I'm not confident that I've built enough to prove to myself that it would work. But now I'm, now I'm certain it will work. Um, will it work well or will it just work okay? I guess that's a remaining question. But I think um, regardless of that, it's a very interesting path to, uh, you know, it, it's an exciting path to explore that has yet to be explored in Bitcoin space. And I hope, you know, my hope is that being more open about it now, you know, as opposed to how crypto projects are all sort of super secretive and uh, nobody ever wants to talk about anything because it's like, because they're all trying to be first, right, right? right? They're all they're all literally trying to be first, and if you don't become first, then you've lost your you know you've lost your initiative. That usually indicates to me that your business model wasn't that great, right? If it depends on you being first, then it's not a unique and novel business model. It's just something that nobody's thought of yet, and whoever thinks of it first wins. I mean, I'd like to think that Frobots is just the beginning of many other business models that you could build which are all sort of similar in the same line, which is let's start thinking about NFTs as agents. Let's start thinking about Bitcoin as a distributed computer. And I'm happy for, other, I'm not, not even more happy. I would be ecstatic if more people started doing projects which are using Bitcoin as a global distributed computer. Need not be competitive robots like what, you know, what robots is, but other, there are so many other things you can build here. I just, that's kind of like my hope in, in this message is like, you know, I'd like, all those Ethereum and Solana developers out there just you know, stop what you're doing and think about, is it really exciting what you're doing and building yet another exchange, yet another, you know, stock trading or token trading application, yet another decentralized finance. It's like, don't you find it ironic that Bitcoin set out to remove the trusted intermediary 
and then an entire entire sector of crypto industry all the developers and ecosystem have spent the last eight years building intermediaries like what is fine what is a financial service it's an intermediary like literally by first principles so the fact that you're building a decentralized one doesn't change the fact that you're just building more middlemen just a decentralized middleman is that really that exciting i think there's so much more exciting things to be doing in the space of pushing you know this whole distributed computational network i mean we are looking at the goal which is the most efficient utilization of all computational resources on planet earth is that not a cooler thing to to, to be working towards than oh i can i can make up you know a token where you can people can stake their money and earn some <laughs> yield for free that sounds really exciting. Um, anyhow, I don't want to sound too, too no, cynical. I like it, though, because it, it's true. I mean, that's what most people are focusing on, like outside of Bitcoin SV. Like, that's what it's like. People are like the next DeFi, the next Bored Apes, the next. And it's all the same regurgitated stuff over and over and over. It can't be fun as a developer to sit there and be like, guess I'm going to work on another. Another. DeFi platform. Yeah, yeah, you know, whatever. Exchange. A uh, uni swap, you know, so that people can change money without, you know, <laughs> without an intermediary, except my code's the intermediary. <laughs> my God. So it makes sense. I like to see how passionate you get about it because that, that whole spiel is like, I'm digging it. I'm digging what you're putting down. So next question, you know, when might we see the beta version come out? And do you have oh. any like concept art you could show us? Ah, uh, okay. I, I I don't like to oversell. So oh, that's okay. Um, we, that's okay. We, we we have been we have been really I I've been very very harsh on the team to keep it low and uh, don't advertise, uh, over advertise because I don't want to let people down. over promise. Keep... Yeah. yeah, exactly. Un over promise, under deliver that that type of thing. Um, but 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 I do, I do want to answer your question as well. Um, so so you know we have a website frobots.io, and if you go there, there is a there is a sort of a sneak sort of preview kind of sign up for the beta, which I think communicates a little bit of the theme that we're going towards. Um, we're, we'll hopefully have um, a more sort of like graphic filled website probably within a month or two. Um, you know, no promises, but I'm I'm actively looking for more uh, to hire more help in that area. So, you know, if that sort of pans out, then uh, hopefully within a couple of months, we'll have like an info site. Um, in terms of the beta, if you go to the Frobots.io site, it's already, you can sign up for the, the beta. So we're taking signups and um, we're working on a private internal beta first because the front end is not built. So, you know, only developers. So sorry, you're, you're like initially for the beta, you're gonna have to write actual code. So. Um, <laughs> Mostly because we also, you know, I want to debug, I want to catch all the bugs in the code interpreter before, before we move it to the the simplified block editor. Um, so, so so I think the beta will probably also be within uh, one or two months um, internally, but uh, like I said, I think the the end goal is probably the release, like a public beta release, um, will probably be early next year, because that includes like. A public beta, you know, it's we're not going to release a public beta without a proper front end, like a right. proper graphical, un, like something that looks respectable and what you would expect from a mobile game these days, right? Not a two-dimensional <laughs> grid. So, so is this something that you're only going to be able to see, like, uh, you know, on the computer? Or are you making out an app for it? So, like, you can open up your phone and be like, hey, there's robots. Or is it just yeah. going to be on the, on the website end right now? Uh, initially, we're focusing on the web platform initially um and and after that's launched we'll start le we'll start working on the mobile platforms the reason is uh because um there's there's uh, there's other considerations with mobile that's kind of um th uh, that are complicated because yeah. like writing writing like i don't ipad maybe i mean clear my, my kids use ipad to to do block editing code so an ipad would be playable uh for sure um but mobile be hard because i you know how do you get people to even write even with drag and dropping blocks and it's it's kind of complicated on your phone but maybe there'll be a view only you know version so you yeah. can watch fights That'd so that maybe cool. you know uh, you wouldn't be able to program your robot yourself but you can sort of like watch other fights going on uh, on, on the mobile and so that's something that we can think about yeah i would love to see like uh some like 
API, I think it's called API integration where like, uh, I could be like watching a game uh, between yeah. these guys go off and I, I could just like grab like the code to watch the game and like and put it into Twitter and be like, hey, I'm watching the game between X and X or X and Y. Come watch it with me. That yeah. sort of thing. Like being able to allow people to self advertise in that way. That'd be pretty cool as well. Because um, if I had a bot and I was like, hey, I'm going to win. Watch me. Yeah, I, I'd want to be able to quickly port that over in, uh, in, in that sense, right? So yeah, and, and have a troll box on the side so the people oh, can yeah. be like hanging you on like, uh, yeah, you suck, da 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 da, I'm gonna kick your butt. <laughs> I mean, I, I could see it getting very competitive. I mean, I remember sitting there on the couch with my, with my uh, oldest daughter and, and watching the robots uh, fights. Cause I think back in like 2015, 2016, they brought it back for a little while. And I remember us sitting there and she'd be like, oh, she, they got him. I was like, man, that, that's super cool. So just the whole right. concept of that being like online, I, I'm really digging it a lot. Yeah. I, I watched, uh, yeah, BattleBots quite a bit too. I, I Well, the American one. I know the British one, yeah, yeah. they made another version. Um, oh, that, that looked totally insane. I watched it recently on the internet. <laughs> they, like they have giant like killer bots that just go out and start killing everybody when the time's up <laughs> or some like sudden death round. I was like, wow, take it to the next level. Um, but but yeah, I, to I, I love that idea of of spectator sport, but also it's a skilled sport, right? I mean, for the people, for the players, or the users who are building the robots, it's skilled. It's not, it's not luck based, yeah. and I think that's kind of very important because if it's luck based, it, you know, it kind of treads close to gambling, then, right? And I, I mean, not, not, not nothing wrong with gambling where it's a, where it's totally legal, for, you know, for you to do, but um, it, it's still it's still more of a okay, are, you're just recycling money, then, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you're recycling money for fun. That's gambling, right? right Among right. friends, you're just sort of you know, you're redistributing money for fun, right? You maybe sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, you're in it for the fun because it's all friends, right? But then obviously there's degenerate gambling and those people just losing money to the house. But uh, that's that's obviously not good. But, uh, but when there's a skill aspect to it, it's not gambling anymore, right? Because you're learning how to write better code. I mean, and, and that's kind of like why I, I really got into this because I started out in this journey thinking to myself, the problem with with a global distributed compu computer on Bitcoin is that people don't write code in a Bitcoin way. So I was trying to solve that problem is how do I compile a high level language like like JavaScript or Clojure or something and then turn that into Bitcoin transactions or Bitcoin script so that can be executed on a global network computer. The problem is like, I'm not going to get this whole mass of people able to do, to, to write e even, it's hard to compile something into Bitcoin because you still have to write it in a Bitcoin-y way. Anybody, any developer who's played with Solidity and Ethereum or S-Script and BSV knows you, you're not writing a standard programming language, right? You, you, it, it is, you can kind of see the Bitcoin-y um, <laughs> characteristics right. up, up, at the, up at the highest level. So, so... I, I sort of structured Frobots so that you're effectively writing a Bitcoin contract. I mean, your Frobot is a Bitcoin contract. So unknowingly, you know, if this game becomes crazy popular, hopefully my wish is that in five, 10 years, you have this whole cohort of people able to program Bitcoin. It's just that they never, they didn't know it. Uh, all they need to do is maybe just have a very simple compiler, which changes their Frobot code into Bitcoin script. Now you have a Bitcoin con smart contract. I mean, now it's no longer a robot fighting a game, but you know, I mean, your brain is already taught that. Wow. And, right? That, yeah. that, that, so there's a huge educational aspect to this. And this is why, you know, I don't think it's, it's, it's gambling or, I mean, it's, it's sort of skilled gaming, but educational skilled gaming. You're I mean, later on, people that have like massive amounts of BSV that want to come in and play and win, they could pay to, to you know, be the, good, you know, yeah. like, hey, I'm going to go to the best programmers, users in the space and buy their best pieces of code from them and compile it, you know, so they could pay to win. But I wouldn't call that gambling. That's just kind of like, why pay for something when you could just as easily learn how to code it yourself. Yeah. So well, and, 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 and yes, and and, and that's and it's not as bad as pay to win because what you've just described would be a completely legal way for you to play robots later in the game um but it is it is more um 
wholesome, I guess, than a regular play to win because what you've just done is you've paid all that money. You came in as a big as a as a big roller, <laughs> high baller, right? And you're buying these robots that other people have built. You're buying all these parts, these codes, uh, bits, and functions that people have built. You are f you are paying for their living. You've just helped the economy. You've encouraged more developers to develop more because you've shown your willingness to give them money for it. You've contributed to the economy, right? In I guess in the same way someone was willing to pay you for your Warcraft gold, right? <laughs> Except, did you did you learn anything from mining Warcraft gold? Pro probably, probably you learned not. less. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, did you get better at gold? I mean, I guess you, you could say you learned how to get really efficient at mining Warcraft gold. In the same way, in Frobots, a developer would actually become a better developer the more they, they, they thrived in this economy. And the person who bought this Frobot um, is just an owner. Right. So what they bought is they've just bought the rights to the income stream or the rights to control the ownership of this robot, which could be for trading. Right. They could just be flipping it or they could actually use it in, in matches. Um, of course, using it in matches has risk because if you start losing, then your, your record goes down, value goes down. So um, there it, it is not a is not a guaranteed win. Right. That's what I'm trying to say. And that is how the real ideal economy works all right people come in you are allowed to buy companies right that's not a bad thing um because there are risks with that purchase as well you can mismanage that robot you can buy it and do nothing with it and then you know if you try to sell it five years later people will be like hey it hasn't actually played a game in like five years maybe it sucks now maybe it can't compete i don't know i don't think it's worth that much well, your mistake then, Mr. High, high Baller. Well, it's going to incentivize the economy just to do more. And if somebody comes in and buys like all the best pieces of bots from different programmers or users, whatever you want to call them, yeah. and then compiles them into one bot and they play that bot, you know, a lot. And all of a sudden that bot becomes unbeatable. All the users are going to be, okay, let's write even better code this time to outcompete the bot that we ourselves helped create that exactly. type of deal so it's, it's like a continuous thing ah I, I i like that you said that because uh that was the last uh topic i didn't touch upon play balancing the uh, the, the play balancing aspect of robots is so interesting to me personally as a computer scientist well electrical engineer with a lot of computer science background um is because that that the, you just keep there's no there's no ultimate winning strategy and that's that's what makes the game so in in my mind probably w w will make it last for a very long time all right think of the games that last a long time right international chess right ego or go right it lasted thousands of years because the rules are very set um and they're balanced very balanced right. as balanced as it can be um but with robots the rules is open so how do you play balance that? Well, b b the rules are open as in like, you're not restricting anybody to, you know, you can do employ whatever strategy you think best, right? So there's no like, it's not like rooks only move this way, bishops only move diagonal, like that kind of thing. Um, but because the, the it's open, that means that anytime you get one winning strategy and you've shown your strategy and people have figured it out, then I think people can figure out a way to beat it. it there's, there's never an ultimate win all, never be defeated strategy because people will, can always look at how to beat you if they have fought you enough, if they have seen your strategy enough. And right. that's why it's a continual top them. It's like a red queen game, just like Bitcoin, like Bitcoin mining, right? Um, it, it's, it's the game where you have to just keep on improving, otherwise you, f you lose. So, that's the game right and, and and the continual improvement means the only um people who will constantly be able to extract an income extract value out of this are the people who become very good at identifying strategies and writing ones that can counter it the developers so i think this is a game which ultimately grooms and trains good smart analytical thinking developers and that's like the ultimate in a goal. fun imaginative way where we can actually bring more developers into the space for yes. and then boom they're already uh, you know predispositioned to, to to know how to how to do all execute all of these functions so boom all of a sudden the lack of developer problem that we've been seeing within the community is suddenly solved hopefully yeah <laughs>
That's awesome. <laughs> it's it's kind of like incepting, right? Like how do we how do we solve these problems that we're we're facing like as a community and economically? And then boom, you're just like robots. I'm here to. Say <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I kind of see the problem as I mean, not problem, but I see the issue with the the current uh, crypto spaces we have all of this easy money right all of this easy money inflated economy and, and with an inflated economy you have all this easy money this easy money is making it very very hard to get good developers because look as a as a starving javascript program or whatever you know you're not going to say no to a couple million dollars thrown at you <laughs> a couple million dollars in a token right all right you, you're not it's hard right and, yeah. and I, I get that it, it's and and it's not that you can you can stand there and say that's unfair right people are using like an inflated uh, you know tokens to pay developers and that's why you're getting all the good development you can complain about that or you can just say like well how do you how do you counter incentivize or well, i'm i'm also giving a possible way for developers to make money right except it's like show, show you know show who's best you know make make money competitively with coding and you know, I'm not saying that robots is enough to take, you know, to take all the steam out of the huge amount of it, developers going into the, all these other projects. But I think it is the it's a step in the right direction. I think we all need to think about like, stop, stop complaining. I mean, we, I mean, like people in the BSD right, right, right. community. I mean, I think we need to stop thinking about like, um, how do we how do we stop all that fake money paying others all those de good developers? I think we should start about what we can be doing to incentivize those good developers in a way which isn't following the same sort of scammy model that other token projects are. Let's do it the legitimate way. Maybe they don't they don't make enough as much money initially. It's not like here's millions of dollars, you know. But I think we have that we have the whole long term greedy short term you know um, frugal. <laughs> What's the opposite of greedy? Short, short term, short term, poor, long term, greedy, or something like that. <laughs> I don't know the the whole like uh, game mechanic of of being able to. You mentioned Go. I remember um, like there the, the Go has been played for so long that strategies from like uh, long long ago, like a thousand years ago, their strategies are so much different than the strategies that are played in modern day Go. And so just through all those years, you could see like the transitions, but it's funny because if you went back and somebody played like as a, somebody that played like a thousand years ago and they came and played against a modern day person, the modern day person is going to have problems playing against somebody that has strategies from like a thousand years ago. And so I, I, I'm thinking about that and, and it's just kind of blowing my mind about how much can be done with that because you know, let's say this takes off and then in, in like a few years time, everybody forgets how it was played back, you know, starting out. And then somebody <laughs> comes back and starts playing like they did when when right. the game first came out. And so it introduces it reintroduces dynamics back into the game. And and you can't just keep out competing everybody else because you can you can also have to go back to the basic. Yes, yes. It's it's swimming around. It's swimming around in the old noggin. And I'm like, wow, super interesting. <laughs> The, the thing about Go and chess um, and the reason it's lasted thousands of years is because your opponent is another human or, or, or you have another dynamic opponent, right? So it's not like playing StarCraft, right? You, I mean, clearly you can play another opponent, but you're both working within the, ver within the very constrained rule system that the game has set out for you, right? You can right. only build like a, a worker within, you know, six seconds uh, and it'll take you X amount of time. You have to build these buildings before you can build an ultralisk, right? You just can't break those rules. And so there, because there, there are so many rules, there, you, there is an optimal strategy, right? If you want to do this, there's an optimal, there's only one or two or three ways to getting this goal most optimally whereas in a game like go or chess more so go especially it's like there is there are so many strategies and the right one is is never clear the right one depends on who you're playing it's yeah. like if you if you can figure out oh this guy's doing this right he's being aggressive here then maybe i need to do that so there's always a tit for tat kind of movement and that's exactly the, that's what Frobots is, right? Because there's no, you don't know what kind of strategy your opponent is going to employ when you just jump in the ring, right? So, so, so literally, your chances of winning are are literally always fifty percent on the first round, right? Because you don't yeah. know what they're doing, and then after you see what they're doing, maybe in the second round you can you can compensate and start uh, modifying your code to beat that, and so it becomes very much. I like to think 
uh, and, and what, what's that? Well, we're not eternal, but uh, it, it's it's like a game that will, will will last the ages because there's because it really depends on your opponent, like you said. I mean, people could evolve to to always expecting this kind of gameplay because you know there was a lot of matches that was always won this way. So now there's like this whole huge cohort of robots which are all kind of similar to that design. But then that may only last like a year or two. And then somebody goes back to an old one, which nobody kind of expected, <laughs> and then wins, right? So, yeah, yeah that's, that's exactly why I think it has lasting power. Um, because it's an open-ended, uh, not rule-wise, but um, strategy-wise. It's, it's sort of so many possibilities. Like Go, right? I mean, I heard that the, possi the number of possible moves, it's, possible it's... games in Go are more atoms in the universe or something. Yeah, like it's insane. It's insane. I, I don't play Go personally, but I had a friend that used to play and he was trying to teach me and I, I couldn't understand it very well. But just the way he spoke about it, super passionate. And I was like, okay, I mean, I, I get it. You know, like you're, it's like chess, but you know, in your own way. But yeah, he was, he was super competitive about it. And he was always like, uh, he was, he had books and books and books of like strategies and they were all from different and he he would study his opponent and go through the books and stuff and so that's what i'm thinking now it's like man people that are going to go up against certain uh certain users they're going to want to study that user and and the the tactics that they most often employ and try to i guess create a bot to to compete against that individual user but at the same time if you create your bot to go up against just one in, in particular user your bot may not be able to go up against a different user that you employs incredibly different tactics so it's you gotta focus on some things that you want to what it is that you're trying to achieve i guess in your own world because if you make it too if you design your bot for for just one thing then you're cutting yourself off from being able to compete against yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going off a little bit on a tangent there, but I, I see I see all of the different things that it's capable of. I'm super excited. <laughs> so, so do you want one final thing to to sort of blow your mind? Um, yeah, yeah. Because because since we're talking about Go, um, you're you're aware of the you know AlphaGo, right? Uh, Google's AlphaGo and how it finally beat humans. Oh no, 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 no! I was oh, not. Really? Yeah. Oh. Okay, that, that that is super super. I, I totally recommend uh, finding online. It's on a YouTube. It's like it's like a documentary on AlphaGo. Um, definitely recommended watching. It's really well done. It's basically uh, outlining how the team that built um, AlphaGo, um, which is the Google uh, project to basically beat humans at this unbeatable game, right? I mean, because Go has always been in computer science held as the one game which humans can always defeat computers. Hmm. I mean, it was like kind of like if computers can beat humans at Go, then, oh, my God, we're going to be taken over by T-1000s <laughs> like tomorrow kind of thing. Right, right. And, and, and well, it happened and we're still alive. So I guess, you know, Skynet isn't among us yet. Yet. But, <laughs> yet. Or maybe it is. And we just don't know. Oh, OK. The Tin Hatters are going to like start running outside and putting on the tin foil in their hats now. Um, the, the But in that documentary, I mean... Um, it explains and it's super interesting, but it, computers finally beat humans, and and they and how it did it is because they got like these this goal pro like this go champion. I mean like a third Don level champion, like third level uh, Don, which is which is good, but not super. He was he's the champion of UK. He's Chinese, mm. but he's living in UK, and uh, he actually went. Oh, sorry, not UK, France. I apologize, France. Um, I don't remember his name but um but he was the he was the guy who went and went to the team in uk uh the google team in uk and helped teach right play the uh, AlphaGo uh algorithm the the machine oh, wow. uh, to train it a bit and and he was like oh i'm gonna kick its butt right i'm gonna like I, every attempt at, in the past the human has whooped the machine's butt right and he he thought he was gonna whoop its butt and uh he lost and he he basically had um, he was so shocked he just left the office he went he went he he walked around London for an hour he had a come to Jesus moment like where he thought his whole life was like meaningless wow. like he literally thought like you know this is the end of the world um, and if you play Go you can kind of you can understand but if you don't um, you know may, may you just have to you know you have to know Go because Go is one of those games where you need intuition it's super intuitive like I, i'd yeah. see my i'd see my buddy like play himself on a chessboard uh, or on the on the go board yeah. and 
it was like a whole battlefield un unfurling on the chest on the board itself and you're like right. what is going on because it seems so intense but yeah it's just and, him staring at it yeah and, and and so you know to get a computer to understand that from from any sort That's of algorithm super... it's very unfathomable right unfathomable fathomable um <laughs> <laughs> uh so, so that that's why um so so that was just the third don guy but but that's only third don right you know nine don is the highest level and this guy from from paris he wasn't in the circles like he could not even challenge the the ninth don level guys i think he's from korea or something like that or china one of them um and and so he was like okay it beat me that's pretty scary but i don't think it can really play like the top level ones and and actually he he uh the the okay the, i'm gonna cut the, the 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 thing short the documentary basically ends up with him um actually it, it played the the highest level don, uh ninth don guy from korea and it it beat him soundly like it i think he only won one game out of five and he was visibly shaken like he was in his description of what it felt like was he was playing an alien intelligence, which was super interesting from a cognitive science perspective, because go like you have to understand your opponent in order to win, and as good as the human players became, they were only good at playing other humans, and wow. and that kind of gave you gives you an insight on what makes us human. Like we all, no matter what culture you come from, we all have certain things that we that we share like we're afraid the same way we 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 analy analyze risk the same way right you do this i might lose this you know i don't want to lose this uh, and and for him he said this thing that he was playing was not human and it would it would never he, it's unrecognizable it was making moves that made no sense it was losing pieces left right and center and he made no sense until at the end of the game Boom! Everything fell. Apart. Everything fell together, and he, and like he lost. Oh man! Was, I like, can only so imagine scared. him like going back home and like replaying each move that was yeah. made like on the board and like trying to figure out like where it all went wrong. Yeah. No, like, he, precisely. he did. I mean, he did. Yeah. In the documentary, they go into, they go into his analysis, and he realized. And this is like everybody's been picking apart these games for the last I don't know five ten years. It's, it's been a while since it's happened. <laughs> Um, yeah. But 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 to circle around to my point, sorry, right, I, right, I, right. We're, we're having discussions, so we're hey. making long-winded points. We're having fun. It's cool. The, I think you know, Frobots is one of those games where you can train an AI to play to, and I think it'd be really interesting to see what strategies an AI comes up with. And I, honest to God, don't know off the get-go whether humans will win versus AI or AI versus humans because because i don't know because i i, I don't know it, it's it's so open-ended it's like okay if human does this is the ai smart enough but the ai only trains itself on past games but humans always have that intuition is, is our ais at the level where it can guess what strategy the human will do next after it does x like after i i show i show the human this like this perf this battle like I, I actually play one battle I have to be able to predict what the human's going to do next. And and maybe AIs can do that now because, you know, we lost an, at Go. Or maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. And uh, so so that's kind of like an interesting thing, which hopefully... Maybe which it's hopefully one of those things with just enough compiled data of previous games, they're able to judge what the user is going to do next by tossing away their pieces, not frivolously, but like instinctively being like if i toss this here and then they make this and i lose that piece then this is going to be their next move so this is how i counteract it and if they're going to play like this then obviously their strategy is going to be very similar to that and then they employ a tactic to to execute that function to beat that in particular user maybe that like thinking about it though that hurts my brain uh <laughs> like, <laughs> But wouldn't it be cool if one day we had like a team, you know, hu team humans versus team AI. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man.
You know, AI kind of scary rank though. On the leaderboard and haste, you know, at the top of the haste leaderboard to be like MIT, you know, uh, uh, Frobot algo, <laughs> right? Put out, put out a bounty like uh, the, the, the AI wins for like so long that people are all like, I'm paying uh, a whole BSV to the first person that can beat this algo, like or this AI. Wow, I mean it. Can take it so many different ways but yeah jerry i know we're uh, we're crossing the, the one hour mark um yeah. i've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation i'm looking forward to frobots i'm looking forward to what you guys are working on and uh i plan on checking out uh the website that you have and uh getting signed up for the beta i can't program or anything personally but it'd be cool to check out nonetheless and and just kind of dip around and see what's going on We'd be glad to have you. Yeah, so frobots.io. Um, and uh, and we're going to get something more on the site soon. <laughs> Did you have any final thoughts or um, anything that you want to say before we, we, we start wrapping things up? Uh, I think we covered quite a bit. I, I, I just, uh, I guess the final thought is I hope, um, you know, this, uh, even if you're not interested in fighting robots, I hope that it inspires <laughs> folks out there listening to, to start thinking about Things that you can build on Bitcoin um, that actually leverage its sort of um, its innovations as a global, you know, uh, computational network. Uh, it's not all about building uh, financial intermediaries or even decentralized ones. Um, that's that doesn't at the ends. I don't think serves uh, society we very much. We only need much. so many of them. <laughs> yeah, you only need so many of them. I mean, you don't you don't need a thousand banks. And just to say that, hey, my bank's never gonna screw me because there's a thousand of them. Uh, we're totally decentralized. I think the world needs ten, ten. <laughs> maybe ten, twenty. Ten seems like a good number, you yeah. know. Yeah, free market decides. Uh, you know, not maximize decentralization for decentralization's sake. It, it seems to be spinning wheels to me. So think about the cool things that we can do. Um, there's there's so many interesting problems in computer science that that Bitcoin can can not well may solve or explore uh, let's say, and and that I think there's plenty of money to be made in in going down any of these paths, um, especially now when very few people are looking. It's true. So, Now's the time to build for sure. Yeah. Yeah. All exactly. Right. Well, cool. Jerry, I can't thank you enough for coming on today, giving us the sneak peek about robots and, and giving us the lowdown on what's to come. I'm sure as heck excited. But uh, with that being said, guys, go ahead and hit up the, the likes and uh, smash the subscribe. And we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you for watching. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to our channel and leave a comment below. Share this video with a friend and also follow us on Twitter at Britney Bits.